I am Matt and welcome to the Good Trouble Show. Sorry for that crash zoom there. Uh, always working out the kinks. That's what happens when you're a one man show. Anyway, welcome to the Good Trouble Show. This weekend, I had the honor of attending the first ever conference of the Soul Foundation held at Stanford University. The Soul Foundation is a think tank that brings together experts from academia and government to address the philosophical, policy, and scientific problems regarding the UAP UFO phenomenon. And I have to say, uh, what I heard at this conference really kind of adjusted my view on this whole thing. Um, anyway, so I was fortunate enough to be invited to attend along with my guest today as we will share our personal highlights of the event, which completely blew me away. Um, I was not what I expected. But first, do us a solid and hit that subscribe or follow button. You can follow us on Twitter at, let's see here, Good Trouble Show, and all other social media platforms, including YouTube, uh, at the, uh, at, uh, sorry, at Good Trouble Show and at The Good Trouble Show. Also, we're on Patreon. We, of course, need help keeping the lights on. You can become a supporter of The Good Trouble Show by going to www.patreon.com forward slash The Good Trouble Show. And for the price of a Starbucks coffee, you can support our work. Also on YouTube, let's turn that off. Also on YouTube, Super Chats are open and are a great way to donate to our show. Your financial support enables us to bring you great content. Okay, so on with the show. Our guest today is a 13-year aerospace industry professional and a volunteer for the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics Integration and Outreach Committee on UAP. I mean, that's a freaking mouthful right there. Please welcome Nick G. Nick, how are you? Hey, Matt. Thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, this is very exciting times. I, it, it truly is. I, I have to say, I, as I said in the intro, I'm, I, I'm really kind of, in some ways, sort of fried from the event mentally. It was, it was a lot to process, <laughs> and uh, I, I wasn't there for the first day due to work, unfortunately. But uh, I, so I rolled in there uh, on only a, a few hours of sleep, and and I was, I, yeah, I can't even really sort of express how. It just made me think about a lot of things with this whole UAP, uh, UA, uh, UFO thing, and uh, you know the consequences of um, you know what we're going to talk about. So uh, since I wasn't uh, there on day one, maybe kind of give us a little bit of a uh, of a highlight. And actually, before I do this, I'm going to try. We because we weren't allowed to uh, record anything. We weren't allowed to take uh, photos of anything. We were asked not to tweet or do any social media during this, this, uh, this conference. So unfortunately, I'm, I'm a little bit less prepared than I would, uh, would like to be. And as I mentioned, uh, I missed day one. But uh, this whole thing, of course, was organized by uh, Gary, Dr. Gary Nolan of Stanford University. Um, he's been on our show once, one of our highest rated shows ever. The man is just, I, my hat just goes off to the guy. So, uh, so with that, uh, why don't you go ahead and just walk us through what happened on day one, and then we'll really dig into day two, since I was there and can hopefully comment a little bit on what I thought. Sure. Yeah, of course. Uh, just a, a little disclaimer first. I know you introduced me as part of AIAA. All the all this commentary is my own opinions. I don't speak. Um, I'm not speaking officially on behalf of that organization. Um, but it was nice to see some of our members there at the Soul Foundation conference. Um, so as far as my reactions, um, I think some some members of the, the community that pay attention to this topic um, were expecting some revelations uh, at this conference, and you know we we didn't really get many new revelations, um, but more it was we got added context. And uh, what, it, what it really represented to me was an, a very strong interdisciplinary call to action uh, for what is, what is inevitably coming down the road, which is greater public disclosure of uh, the UAP phenomenon from official sources and opening that up to uh, scientific community and eventually to, to industry. Um, I found it incredibly intellectually stimulating and, and very challenging at times. Uh, a lot of the topics discussed uh, had very 
very heavy weight and gravity. Um, some things that, you know, members of this community may not have an appreciation for until they hear from the people that have, have worked in, in these types of roles. Uh, we really put our intelligence officials in an impossible position. Um, and there, you know, there doesn't need to be any nefarious intent. They're, they're following the law, they're doing their jobs and hats off to them for trying to, you know, do it in an ethically, uh, sound way. Um, it was a, also a great opportunity to make connections. Uh, lots of people from represented, uh, different, um, areas of, uh, academia, the, um, industrial base, government, military. Um, and what I see this as is, uh, the beginnings of an increasingly more visible college. Uh, there were about 300 of us in that room. And uh, I think those numbers are just going to keep growing, Matt. Yeah, I, I totally agree. What, what was interesting is, and probably I think a lot of the people, or, or some people probably weren't aware, there were um, uh, congressional staffers in attendance. There were uh, uh, people from the intelligence community, uh, three-letter agencies that were in attendance, and from other uh, DOD-related uh, three-letter agencies. Um, you, of course, uh, had uh, the academics and, and the people that, that we've all seen, that Chris Mellon and, and folks that I think everyone here is aware of. Uh, there was one individual that I met that was part of the UAP task force that uh, has not gone public, but had extensive, extensive discussions with him. But I, I think the thing to keep in mind, you have these crazy ass debunkers that are so disconnected from reality. Um, it's, I swear it's, it's some kind of psychosis these, these uh, debunkers are uh, suffering from. But you know they would probably characterize this thing as a bunch of UFO nuts and whatnot, and uh, just a big UFO, um, you know, in a disparaging way. But the fact of the, ma the matter is there were a lot of people from the national security establishment, both present and former that were there, uh, some of which made presentations and we're gonna get into that. So yeah, so uh, yep. what were the highlights for day one for you? For day one, yeah. So day one was very much uh, the theme is the scientific angle. Um, so we had speakers like, uh, Avi Loeb, Beatrice Biaroids, uh, Kevin Knuth, Gary Nolan, Jacques Vallée, uh, Diana Pasolka, uh, Peter Scafish, and then closing out with a round table hosted by Leslie Keen uh, with Hal Putoff and Larry McGuire, a uh, member of parliament in Canada. Um, so I think uh, to your earlier point about, um, you know, people that may not be so receptive to this topic, um, Avi Loeb, I think, just took that down uh, right off the bat. He was the first speaker. And uh, one of the quotes that stuck with me that he said is, why is childlike bullying more prevalent than childlike curiosity? Um, wow. And he re his, uh, his angle is really, you know, go, go find the data and, and make conclusions about what the data is telling you. You know, don't make presuppositions about uh, data that you don't have just because uh, you feel that you're the expert in your field, and if something's unfamiliar to you, that's not that's not reason enough to dismiss it out of hand. So what he's doing with Galileo Project, setting up these observatories, um, you know, in different geographical locations, uh, getting getting different cross sections of of data for for UAP, I think is going to go a long way to to getting that critical data, so that that we can start to formulate reasonable and meaningful conclusions about what they are, how they work, what they, what they might represent. Um, and, uh, and yeah, that, that same philosophy really should, you know, permeate throughout the scientific community. It's like, there's something here we don't understand. Let's go out and spend the time and resources and effort to, to figure it out. Uh, and that similar sentiment was echoed by pretty much all the, all the speakers that day. Yeah, I, I wish I could have been there for for that first day. So so let's move on to day two. So hopefully I can add a, a bit of commentary uh, to this as well. You know, one thing I'd like to note is the the speakers, especially that come from the national security background, these are the real deal folks. And the thing that I, I would say, one of the things I would characterize day two was 
There was no sort of pussyfooting around of, you know, if there is uh, some kind of non-human intelligence. It was just, this is what's going on. It is real. The government is aware of it. They're in a pickle uh, in, in trying to figure out how to roll this out and that there are a lot of extremely serious consequences that everyone needs to think about in, in terms of how how this is going to roll out and the potential second and third order consequences uh, that are that are going to happen. So uh, first person I'd like to to uh, talk about is uh, uh, let's see, Admiral Tim uh, uh, Gall Galladay. He was on my show and I absolutely butchered butchered his last name. Uh, and I actually went up to him and apologized said, hey, I'm sorry, I really uh, uh, butchered your name on my show. I, I'm still uh, trying to uh, learn how to be a good host. Uh, anyway, so uh, let's see here. So, uh, so uh, the Rear Admiral, uh, he's U.S. Navy retired, former administration of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. I thought his presentation was absolutely one of the most powerful. So uh, what were the highlights of, of what Tim had to say? And again, I wish we had been, a, been allowed to take photos of the PowerPoint presentation because there was a lot of significant stuff in there. Anyway, Nick, so yeah, what were your thoughts on, on Tim? Yeah, Ad Admiral Tim was a, definitely a highlight for me. Um, not only is he a, an incredible speaker, he's just such a high caliber individual and scientific professional and just has so much depth of experience across uh, the military and, and, um, and uh, you know, the official science bodies of our government. Um, so what, what really struck me is that like we, we really don't have a good read on mapping the, the ocean floor on our planet. Um, we have, you know, satellite imagery of every corner of the landmass, and we have really great systems to know what's uh, what's in our um, our skies and our atmosphere and, and, you know, in orbit around the Earth. But a lot of the ocean is still very much unexplored, uncharacterized. So um, he's been uh, working with his organization, Ocean STL Consulting, along uh, in cooperation with, with others um, to, you know, to really light the fire of doing that work of, of mapping the ocean floors. Um, so, you know, like uh, he did uh, touch on, you know, there are some anomalous things that have been witnessed, uh, you know, in his in his time. He uh, he made reference to uh, a, a landform, you know, about um, uh, a couple miles down. And uh, there's basically a wedge of material that was basically looked like it was removed from uh, a knoll on the ocean floor and moved two kilometers away. And that just not, doesn't seem like something that happens naturally. Um, so, you know, stuff like that, that's definitely worth investing, uh, you know, time, resources, equipment, and manpower into, into investigating. Yeah, um, I, when, when and, he brought uh, that, sorry, go ahead. I, I was just gonna say, yeah, when he brought that up, he really emphasized that and, and of course, he's he's a scientist, and he he understands geological features in the ocean. That's what he did for a living uh, for the United States Navy. And essentially, what he said is it appeared to be a a solid. He wasn't sure if it was a structure, but the way he he explained it is it made no geological sense how it was just kind of sitting um, on its own and. One of the things he had talked about was was uh, the next thing is to send a, a remote underwater vehicle to go and investigate it. But yeah, and, and uh, oh, another thing I thought was interesting too. He spoke about when the when he received on the Cipernet, which is a, a classified email system, when he received as a as an admiral from uh, his chain of command footage of the Tic Tac uh, uh, video and the people in the chain of command saying across this email, hey guys, what is going on? We don't know what this is. And he said the following day, everything, all the email chain was completely deleted off of Cipernet and nobody spoke about it afterwards. And, they, and the gist of that email was a considerable safety of flight concern I mean, yeah, that that surprised me. What were your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think it just points to the discomfort that we have, you know, admitting that we have an awareness gap. Um, 
this was technological surprise. It, it's what the uh, the whole idea of doing this um, this sort of controlled disclosure is trying to prevent. Um, nobody saw that coming. It's something that far outclassed our our best technology, um, at least uh, you know that we know about. And and uh, we don't have we don't have something to counteract that. Uh, that's the military's job is to is to keep us safe. And if they're not investing uh, the time into trying to understand what these things are, um, you know, the, the worst thing you can do is bury it. <laughs> That's not making anyone any safer. It doesn't inspire much confidence, um, especially when, uh, you know, our, our service members that are out there, you know, uh, keeping us safe, working on our behalf, uh, like Lieutenant Ryan Graves, who was flying in Whiskey 72 and encountering, you know, unex unexplained objects and wasn't able to report them is exactly the, the wrong approach. So, yeah, there's definitely a lot better that we can do here. I, I completely agree. And again, I think one of the important things to impress upon the audience, all of these people that came up, and these are not um, UFO enthusiasts, I hate that term. Uh, these, are all, these are all professional and uh, professionals and people like Admiral Tim uh, Galladay. This is what they dealt with. And they were very clear, this isn't some theoretical thing or it's not seagulls, it's not um, something being mistaken for a 747 or one of or whatever one of Mick's uh, uh, crazy explanations are. They were very matter of fact, this is what is going on. It's not from here. Our, our, our country, our national security establishment, intelligence establishment cannot bury their heads on this because it endangers the lives of our men and women in uniform. And that was a, another point I think he really hammered home as well, is that this kind of uh, cognitive dissonance is just, it's, it, it endangers the lives of our servicemen and that's not, that's not acceptable. Uh, anything more that you'd like to add about, uh, about Admiral Tim's uh, presentation? Um, I, I just thought that he was <laughs> such a personable guy. Like he, he seems very genuine when he speaks. Um, and, and he knows he's a very good communicator. So you knew exactly what, what his angle was here. Um, he's, he's very, he feels very strongly about the, the misplaced priorities. You know, he did make mention of, uh, climate change, which obviously is a very real and very important issue. But um, the military, just the U.S. military uh, working very hard to reduce its emissions, uh, it's important, but it's a drop in the bucket uh, over, you know, what other things we should be looking at. Um, and UIP is one of, is definitely high on the list of those things. Um, yeah, I, I, I think that's kind of a yep. main takeaway from Tim's talk. Yeah, and, and folks, uh, because we really only have an hour today, I'm trying to kind of rush through it and just hit, hit the highlights. Uh, and I know, Nick, you, you have to go at the top of the hour. If I'm able to, I'll stay on a little bit more to answer some questions. We're going to try and reserve the, the last 15 minutes uh, of uh, 345 our time uh, for listener questions. Okay, let's move on to uh, Jarius uh, Victor Grove. I had never heard of this guy, but Wow. Um, yeah. Um, okay. I don't even know where to start. So, so let me, I'll give a gentleman from Hawaii. From Hawaii. Yeah. Let me, sorry. And I know I'm stepping on you slightly. Uh, I just want to give a, a quick uh, bio. So he's director of Hawaii Research Center for Future Studies and chair a Department of Political Science, University of Hawaii. And one thing I can tell you, this guy's been uh, writing studies, white papers for the policymakers in the U.S. and the United States government. Okay, uh, Nick, off to you. Yeah, the the um, the gist of what I got from from uh, Grove's talk is, you know, he's very involved with like threat assessment and risk reduction, and these are things that that are common across, you know, the aerospace industry where where I work. Um, you know, he uh, he uh, talked very closely to his paper called "Crowded Skies: Atmospheric and Orbital Threat Reduction in an Age of Uncertainty," uh, uncertainty um, uh, which is a framework for the UAP issue in global political context. So he was uh, emphasizing, you know, we need more international cooperation and democratic accountability on the issue. 
And uh, we really need to analyze, like, what are the implications for possible future um, with, you know, with UAP in, you know, in public view uh, and how to move forward. Because we don't currently have any policy agenda for, for UAP. So uh, it's if there's too many unknown unknowns, you don't know how to mitigate those risks. And his his talk was pretty bleak, to be honest. Uh, yeah, it was. I just got the feeling like like we're very over constrained in this area with, you know, we got to make sure we execute, we, we assess, analyze, prepare and execute very effectively going forward or something catastrophic could happen, whether it be um, some kind of misunderstanding between the nuclear powers, China, Russia, the United States. Uh, that could, you know, throw us into a thermonuclear war. Uh, and and th these are things we all need to be mindful of. He he did not pull any punches in, in his discussion. Yeah, w one of the things that, that stood out for me, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, if this was maybe another people, uh, another person, and uh, I'm just misremembering, but he, he spent a considerable amount of time talking about, uh, let me ask you this. He was the guy that was talking about, you know, the percent, the percentage risk of a civil war during the 2024 election and the, the risk of disclosure precipitating an armed clown conflict. It was this guy, right? I just want to make sure I'm not. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, and I'm trying to remember this as, as best I can, but essentially what he laid out, they had done studies that that weighed or, or sort of presented what the percentage risk of something occurring, uh, 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 catastrophic happening. And one of the things that he, he was very clear about was that the government is in a real pickle. Um, there is a lot, and I'd never heard of this before, but he had, he had discussed, and I forgot the term he, he used, but he had discussed the uh, the strategic advantages and disadvantages to being the first country to officially disclose, and what he essentially explained is that it is a a really difficult decision because it is fraught with a lot of bad results. Um, not so much. I mean, of course, there was was talk about societal disruption. But one thing that I had never thought about was how he, he spoke about, and I don't remember the exact details, how the first, the first country to disclose that they have recovered craft raises by some factor um, the chance of an armed conflict happening with, with, with that country. So for instance, we, we uh, publicly admit this is what we have. And if we are not careful in how that is presented, China and Russia um, will view that in a, a not in a good way. And the risk of miscalculation and an armed conflict coming out of this is 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 actually significant. What do you remember that part of the the convo? That that really threw me. I'd never thought of that. Yeah, I mean, he he dealt with a lot of. Uh you know, areas of this issue in his paper and, and worked through many different frameworks. Um, but I think, uh, you know, one one of the things you could think of is hypothetically saying that, you know, if it is confirmed that we have reverse engineering programs and so do other countries, we may not know the full extent of the capabilities that our adversaries have, have extracted from potential exotic technologies. And if we start using them, they might view that as a permission structure that so can they. And then, then your 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 outlook is full of unknown unknowns. Um, so you know, even even uh, if it's even conceivable, weapons more terrible than nuclear weapons. I mean, that's definitely speculative. But uh, I, I think that was just kind of pointing to his 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 thesis that, you know, inter international cooperation is going to be very important in trying to align the interests of all the parties involved. Um, it, it should, it should be, uh, it should be a, a, an atmosphere of cooperation. So, you know, uh, one of the examples he gave was space junk. 
you know, we can't track and abate all the space junk that we have in low Earth orbit or, or medium Earth orbit anymore. It's just becoming too much. So it's just one bad accident could knock out the communications uh, capabilities for, you know, our military, China's military. Um, what happens after that <laughs> is, yeah. is anybody's guess. And, and the other thing he had talked about, he had spoke about too, he had given an example of submarines encountering uh, unidentified submerged objects. And let's say that at a, at a period of, of heightened tension with, with China or someone and one of our assets collides with uh, a, uh, a vehicle of non-Earth origin, the, the repercussions of that spinning out of control militarily are significant because they uh, something like that could be misconstrued as a as an attack on on uh, one of our blue forces by one of uh, one of our red forces and even from the commercial point of view he had, he had pointed out that that UA, UAP encounters or, or are happening so much more that you run the risk of having a collision between one of these vehicles and a commercial aircraft. Uh, and again, how an event like that can be misconstrued. He also spoke about, as, as he said, on the, on the, um, you know, the risks of a nuclear miscalculation. And we're going to drop a little bit of news here and we'll talk about it later. But uh, during the hearing, you heard David Grush uh, speak about a particular document uh, related to the Russian nuclear hotline. And I can tell you, uh, we were the one that actually discovered this document in D.C. when we were doing some research um, at the National Archives. And uh, this was a, back in January, and we forwarded it up, uh, up the chain, um, and so it's now in congressional record. And I'll, I'll uh, at some point soon do an episode on, on this particular document, which is uh, the operating instructions for the Russian nuclear hotline. And I think what, what we'll reveal in this uh, piece of uh, information is, is uh, eye-opening. Okay, let's, uh, let's wow. move on now uh, to uh, uh, Carl Nell. So uh, let's see, here's, uh, here's uh, Car uh, Colonel Carl Nell. Um, again, another extremely, extremely sobering presentation. Um, I, you know, I, I think a lot of us, you know, we all are wanting all the, the goods to come out. Uh, we want disclosure. We don't want secrecy. And I, I think it was Carl that noted that without secrecy, a government cannot survive, a country cannot survive, that certain secrets are, you know, are, are essential. And again, he, he, I think probably for me that his, his presentation was the most significant in the somberness and the seriousness of how all of this will go down and the incredible risks uh, to society, uh, world economy, being a world-based economy, and just that this whole thing is wrought with a lot of serious, serious concerns about how this is going to affect uh, people. Um, yeah. Anyway, uh, uh, go ahead and take it away there. Yeah. The, the term he used that really stuck with me was, was we want to avoid a catastrophic disclosure. We def we want to stay within the realm of a dis uh, controlled disclosure process. And that's one in which it's acknowledged, uh, it gets first within government, then within academia, then within society at large and the public uh, about, you know, reality of UAP, number one, and then number two, what the capabilities are, and number three, what it's going to mean for us. Um, and, you know, he, he basically dissected the Schumer Amendment for the NDAA, the uh, UAP Disclosure Act of 2023, which I understand, you know, reading reading some material in the past several days, he had a very major hand in helping craft that legislation. Um, so, I mean, on the one hand, uh, yeah, the, if we get this wrong, things could go sideways very quickly. So it's very important to get it right. Um, but he did give a good point counterpoint, like, 
you know, maybe too much disclosure too fast is a bad thing, but too little disclosure too slowly is also a bad thing. Um, and, and he laid out a time, a potential timeline that kind of lined up with some of the Schumer amendment milestones. Like, I think one of the ones that people were largely complaining about or, or, you know, were kind of surprised at was uh, broad public acceptance by 2030. And I think because you were in the room and so was I, he did mention that that, that number is really only the reference when the, the U, uh, UAP Records Review Board is supposed to sunset. So that's really kind of the deadline. That's when they have to get all the stuff out, because if they don't, then, um, you know, we're, we're no longer in that controlled disclosure regime. So the, the goal is for everything to happen before that. And, and um, he broke it down into phases uh, where we're trying to sensitize uh, different aspects and disciplines to different things at different times. And I think it pointed to maybe one of the broader themes of the Soul Conference overall is that as professionals interested in working in this topic, we need to start thinking about how to communicate with our peers in a language they'll understand. You know, not everyone is is initiated in this topic. It's it's largely something that's very far away for a, a lot of people that don't follow it. Um, so when the Schumer Amendment passes in in the wider NDAA and the disclosure plan begins to take shape and, and be executed, there will be questions and confusion about what it means for, for people from uh, different areas. And, and that means being honest about, you know, what are the known knowns, what are the known unknowns, and what are the unknown unknowns. And, and while it's impossible to fully mitigate all those risks, we have to get as many people as possible on board and uh, thinking about this uh, so, so that we can, that we, you know, that we're, we're going to make it. I, I, yeah, I agree. And again, to everyone in the audience, they were not coming from uh, people like Colonel Carl Nell were not coming from a, a place of, you know, if we are being visited and if these things are real, it was all, this is what is happening. It is real. There are serious consequences to this. One of the things, and I'm sure you would agree, Nick, the, the mood in the room during at least the day that I was in there, it was somber. I mean, it was, as Lou Elizondo once, once stated regarding this subject, there was not any real joking around. People, um, I think people were frankly rather shocked by what, um, how they were framing the, the seriousness of the, of, of the consequences to this news and how it, it can just go wrong in terms of uh, societal order, uh, mil risk of military, mis uh, uh, conflict and misunderstanding. And it was just, it was a no shit, this is really serious, folks. This isn't some hobby. We're talking about uh, our national security, our, our security as, as, as a nation. Um, I'm going to just quickly, I made some notes on, on, uh, on Microsoft Word while he was talking. Um, well, just while you're looking that up, yeah, so yeah, I, I just wanted to interject, interject one small point. You could hear a pin drop in that room. Everyone yeah. was paying attention. And look at the number of people that have PhD after their names. These are not, you know, these are not people that take these things lightly. They, they understand the stakes. This is, this is real. This is happening and we need to get ready. And I think he made that point very, very clear. Yeah, you know, the, the thing to keep in mind, the folks that listen to the, uh, the professional uh, debunkers, it's one thing to be a video game uh, developer, and it's another person to, uh, who has experience in national security, has protected our country, that comes from an intelligence background, is a four-star admiral, uh, is an army colonel, um, you have to sit and, and, and look at what the bona fides are of these individuals. And yeah, Nick, I mean, as you said, it was, I think people were really shocked and really had never stopped to think about the consequences of all of this. I mean, it, I, you know, I left there not smiling. It, I, I, and I kind of think most people did not. Um, anyway, kind of just quickly going through my notes. Uh, so, you know, he spoke about the importance of the amendment, uh, how much it, it had significant bipartisan support. 
uh, people in Congress that are read into this. They know it's real. They know it's a national security threat. Um, uh, one of the things that was noted is that no one knows what the agenda is of, of, of these various species that are coming here. And, and with that, you cannot make the judgment that this is all love and light and all of that because you don't know why they're here. Um, he, you know, he also pointed out, too, that throughout history, advanced civilizations, either through colonialism or, or, or other examples, um, that didn't go well for the lesser developed civilization. And, and it's just something to keep in mind. This isn't fun and games. It's not UFO Twitter. Uh, anyway, so, uh, yeah, so uh, he was talking about how it was very uh, uh, bipartisan. They understood the seriousness of it. He also noted, um, uh, this is uh, probably uh, best uh, message for John Greenwald, uh, the FOIA king, that FOIA does not work. Um, it's maybe, it's, it's good for maybe getting some information out, but you will never get to the bottom of this through FOIA. That's, that's, um, that's kind of a sham. You know, even for instance, uh, 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 NORAD is exempt uh, from FOIA. So you can't, you're never going to get this from FOIA ever, period. Sorry, John. Uh, anyway, uh, so and he also spent some time talking about uh, that, that, you know, that some of the, you know, some of these records that held all of this information regarding uh, crash retrievals and whatnot, all of that, or much of that is under the 1954 uh, Atomic Energy Act. And, you know, so for instance, Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick, he has no authority to go and send agents in. He's got some AFOSI agents that work for Aero. They cannot legally go in to the Department of Energy and demand uh, answers because uh, DOE answers directly to the president or to the executive branch. So, uh, so he touched on that about the, the, uh, how the Atomic Energy Act of 1954 uh, really played into this. Um, and, and how a lot of things were made exempt from FOIA, um, et cetera, because they, they are classified under the Atomic Energy Act. Uh, he also explained, too, that the part of the emphasis on this legislation is not putting, um, putting emphasis on non-attributed objects. He called them TNOs. Um, Maybe you, do you remember what the acronym stood for? I had never heard of that. Te temp temporarily non-attributed objects, which, which end are, are things that ultimately end up being, being mundane. You know, these are uncharacterized targets that are still that just prosaic things. Well, it, exactly. And one of the things that he noted yep. in the legislation is that the language of the law, and I was sitting next to Ross Coltart, uh, during that day and, and we were chatting and of course everyone knows Ross is, uh, is a former attorney. The precision of this legislation is absolutely significant. There is no wiggle room for uh, the United States Air Force uh, and AFOSI to, to get around all of this. And we all know they've been complacent or, or um, no, that's the wrong word, uh, a part of a bunch of the illegal activity that, is, that has taken place. Um, uh, so uh, let's see here. One thing he also noted too was that this whole thing is really important to prevent technical, he called a technological surprise. Yeah, what did you think of that? That I thought was significant. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, uh, I think uh, that, that kind of points to the fact that, you know, the the progress that's been made on studying this issue in such a compartmentalized fashion has been so painfully slow that we're not going to be able to keep up with, you know, the new risks that emerge. He, he brought up the fact that, you know, what if doing disclosure alone changes their behavior, whoever they are, uh, and, and they do something unexpected and we're not ready. Um, that's a very real concern too. Uh, and, yeah, I, I think that's I think that's what I took away from that point. One of the I would say the most shocking thing he said 
for me uh, when he really spent some time, and I'd never heard of this term before, but really spent some time on um, what he characterized as a un, um, was a, a, a catastrophic or uncontrolled disclosure, I think is, was that the term he used? Yeah. And, yep. and, and what, and he spoke about how this has to be laid out or put out to the public in a logical, thoughtful way so that we can mitigate the risks as best as possible. But regarding a catastrophic disclosure, what he, what he spoke about, one of the things that would, would, um, would, would constitute an un, a, a catastrophic disclosure is if this non-human intelligence decides to disclose itself in mass and and the chances of the consequences of that absolutely uh, spinning out of control in terms of uh, social order. Yeah, no, for sure. And, and I think this kind of points back to the, there's a desire of a lot of people to just disclose it all right now, just rip the bandaid off and go do it. But I think he, he made very clear, like we need a campaign plan. We need oversight. We need science to be involved. There's different lines of effort across different disciplines that need to be set up. Um, it's, it, it's very complicated. <laughs> and I don't think I had as much an appreciation for it until after I heard him speak about this. Yeah. I, I, I think that's, that would be a, that whole thing, and I know I'm a little bit tongue-tied today. I apologize, but I was, it, yeah, man. I mean, it was, uh, it was shocking. It uh, really made me think about how, what I do as a communicator to responsibly message on this topic, and especially other people in media. We have to be really careful about how we talk about this, and. Um, yeah. Yeah. He, and, and, and essentially he made very what he clear that. Sorry. Go ahead, please. I was going to say he made very clear that the intelligence officials and, and the highly cleared individuals that are working on this are not really the ones you want to be directing your blame at. They didn't set the system up. You know, they're doing the best they can to work ethically within the system they were they inherited. And they don't we shouldn't have to make them carry that weight forever. So. This is just a this is a necessary, painful process we're going to have to go through, and we're it's better to go through it in a controlled fashion. It's it it definitely it definitely does, and I, I didn't take many notes, but uh, in terms of the consequences, but the the examples he gave of how how the shit could really hit the fan, uh, not just here in the country but in the world in terms of the. Um, the, the social chaos, financial chaos, and the military, um, the chance of military confrontation taking place if a catastrophic disclosure takes place. And, and I think really his main point is that that just cannot be an option. So as long as our policymakers and the people in the CIA that can that continue to keep this buried and elements of the DOD in general, uh, the chances of this blowing up and not going well are really significant. And it, it, if you know, if we care about our country and uh, the future of the United States, this this has to be taken care of in the right way and in a in a controlled way. Can I make one final point on, on the Coronel talk? Because during during the Q and A, uh, there was a very poignant question asked by none other than Dr. Jacques Vallée, uh, you know, in his epic takedown of the timekeepers. <laughs> uh, he spoke for quite a long time asking his question, um, but he had everyone's ear. That's for sure. Um, was that the eminent domain provision of the Schumer Amendment needs to be done right? It's it's very important that the scientific community is respected if, especially those that are doing open research and publishing papers that they'd be allowed to continue um, because he's afraid that this this eminent domain of material uh it's problematic because uh, if misused it could end up in confiscation of someone that's doing very good work that's trying to support 
you know, the, the right things that we're trying to accomplish. And, and I think that point was well taken and Carl agreed that, yes, we need to make sure that we get that provision right. Um, and the other, the other aspect of that is that nowhere in this amendment does it address uh, experiencers or what, what this is going to mean to them. Uh, and, I, and I think um, Jacques sees that as a mistake. Uh, you know, you can have different arguments about whether that's a little premature to be having that discussion and maybe that's something that comes later down the line, but it's, it's definitely something that needs to be considered as part of the overall process uh, because uh, it's real to those people, <laughs> I can tell yeah. you. Um, my, you know, there are members of my family that are, that are experiencers and they, they've had terrifying encounters and it's uh it's it's a lot it's it's something that you know only recently many of us have come to recognize as as being real as as something you know that's not just all in their heads it could be due to some external factor and and that's where the scientific community and especially the psychological community will have to come in and be prepared to pick up the pieces because this is it's it's <laughs> It's a lot for everybody, not just the national security angle. I, I had a, a conversation with uh, Christopher Mellon uh, on the side where I, uh, I, I spoke, and a lot of people probably don't know the real story, but um, I began doing sort of, uh, when, I began, when I became interested in this whole, whole topic, I wanted to write an op-ed around it. I was trying to pivot away from covering uh, politics. I was tired of talking about Trump all the time. And, and because of my work in making political ads, it opened up a lot of doors for me in Washington. And, um, and part of that, I had an a, uh, off-the-record conversation with a senator's national security team where they stated, uh, this is real, it's not from here. They're, they are observed uh, going in and out of our atmosphere on our uh, intelligence, surveillance, uh, reconnaissance, space-based assets. Uh, they were very cagey about giving any more specifics about that. Um, it was a bipartisan national security concern. And the thing that stuck out to me the most was uh, the comment from one national security person that said, our entire life, we may never understand where this is from. And I can tell you, I was fucked up for about two days uh, trying to process, because I think it's one thing you know, to hear it on UFO Twitter or something, but when you have uh, a senator's office and their national security staff tell you this, and this, this would have been uh, beginning of 2022. Anyway, right around that time, um, I began having extensive conversations with Robert Hastings. And at that point, uh, about uh, two days later, some weird paranormal stuff started happening in the house. And uh, shortly thereafter, orbs uh, began showing up above, above uh, my house. And uh, we've had, uh, not neighbors, but uh, friends of ours uh, witness it, uh, my wife. And, um, and it has continued uh, to this day. The last significant orb uh, appeared above our home. I wasn't there to witness it. My wife and uh, a friend of ours that was uh, very alarmed by it uh, witnessed it. So it's continued. But the point I was making to Chris Mellon is being someone that has never experienced any of this his entire life, and the same thing for, her, for my wife, the only thing that I could kind of um, surmise was it was due to me beginning to or looking in it, looking into it, or as part of the hitchhiker effect. Robert Hastings has always said it was probably the hitchhiker effect. But one of the questions I was talking to Chris about is, let's say that what has been showing up uh, on a continual basis above my home is due to kind of mentally engaging and thinking about this thing. If all of this gets dumped on the American public in a, an official way and people begin Begin to really mentally engage in this topic. With what what happened to me, does that mean that we run the risk of that all of a sudden happening to tens of millions of Americans of this of this shit showing up above their place and people just going berserk? And it was I can't talk about a lot of the conversation I had with Chris, but as always, he's very thoughtful um, about these things and. Um, 
sorry, I went off on a tangent there. Uh, anyway, uh, any more that you would like to add about uh, Carl Nell? No, I think I, I think that covered it. It was probably the most significant portion of the of the conference for me, at least. Absolutely. Okay. So speaking of uh, speaking of Christopher Mellon, uh, he he followed. Uh, he was a little bit later in in the chat. What uh, what thoughts do you have on uh, what Chris had to offer? His, his presentation was another one that was no it's no shit serious. We got to really think about this. And one of the things I would say that stuck out in my mind is he said this could potentially be a massive Pandora's box, and we should all be extremely careful what we wish for. Take it away. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. No, I think he echoed many of the sentiments that, that some of the other speakers did, but he, he really tied it up in, in a very cohesive fashion. And what's kind of funny, a little, he finished writing the speech the day of he gave the speech. I saw him doing it in the in the lounge area uh, before he was he was talking. So um, I think he, he listened to what the others had to say and tried to add the broader context, which was pretty cool to, to see happen in real time. Um, so I, I, I can't really, you know, give it one theme, um, but some major points that he made is that Congress still hasn't had any, any hearings to assess the impact of disclosure, which is, is, you know, what we all talked about in that room together, but um, it may not be fully evident to those key decision makers or their constituents what all this means yet. And that's a discussion that's going to have to happen sooner rather than later is the, you know, the more and more that this, uh, this thing progresses, um, you know, from the standpoint of the public service servant, uh, how do they, how do they assess the risk and benefit to a particular course of action? All that has to be considered. It's, it's, uh, it's scary. Um, you know, the, he brought up the point, what if disclosure changes the NHI behavior or the government's reaction, uh, things could spiral very quickly as, you know, many of the other, uh, the other speakers alluded to. Um, you know, our top priority is to keep people safe. Are we doing everything we can to do that? Uh, you know, no politician would want to have that press conference if something bad happens. Um, you know, they're in it, you know, for self-preservation probably to, you know, they want to get reelected. So politicians tend to be very risk averse, but there is a very real risk of doing nothing. And uh, I think he made that very concrete. I, yeah, I agree. I think one thing that, that, was, that was really apparent is you understood, or it was, it was made clear in quite a few of these presentations, the gravity of disclosing this whole thing and the chances of it not going well. And, and in a way, I think being sort of uh, something that, that politicians in uh, kind of understandably, but not, uh, are uh, avoid touching this, this sticky wicket. It's the, the consequences of, of make of a, a president or, or, uh, Congress mishandling all of this are uh, the physical consequences are significant. And, um, yeah. And that, that was actually the reason I, I, pulled Chris aside to talk to him about what I had experienced. And he had pointed out that, that what, what had started occurring to me, and again, emphasizing nothing my entire life had ever happened. He said that that is actually not an uncommon thing and that there were plenty of officials and, and people that uh, the UAP issue has been part of their portfolio. Uh, intelligence officials, folks in the DOD had the same experience of me of all of a sudden shit happening that frankly was just not fun. And as I've said many times uh, to friends, I would be more than happy if I never saw a thing again. I know it's real. I don't need to be, I don't need to see anything else. That's, that's, uh, that's fine. So uh, now we're, uh, we got five minutes left with you. And what I'll try and do is, is stay on. I want to, I know I've uh, spoken a lot. Uh, Nick, is there anything else you want to add uh, or in the last five minutes? Um, 
I mean, I would say it was just an honor and a privilege to be invited to this event. I think the it, you could feel it in the room, the caliber of the individuals, their dedication to the topic. Um, it was it was a really special event in a lot of ways, and uh, it, it really, like I said before, it was it's a call to action um, because uh, at this point, I think it, it's becoming clear that this is this is inevitable. Even if Schumer doesn't pass the first time around, it's there's going to be something that's going to move this forward, uh, you know, either by more different legislation or I think you were alluding to the, a potential future event that, it, you know, makes reckoning reckoning with this, uh, you know, unavoidable. So I, I think this is uh, Gary and, and Peter Scafish, who organized this conference, had great foresight in getting the quality and caliber of speakers together to kind of paint this this uh, big picture for all of us that that follow this topic, um, because uh, it's just it's so important. It's probably the most important thing that will happen in our lifetimes. I, I'm pretty well convinced of that. I, I completely I completely agree. Um, and and again, emphasizing this none of this was um, anecdotal stories of experiencers or or any of that, not that that's not important. The focus, I would say, overall of, of at least the day I was there, of this whole conference, is that this is like no shit, really serious stuff regarding the security of our nation and, and um, making sure that this doesn't spiral out of control and um, and that it just, yeah, it's got to really be handled in a very careful way. It's, it's, it's fraught with a lot of risk. And all of these folks were very, very clear um, on this. And I think, as you said, there, it was people, it, was, it wasn't uh, in many ways a fun time. Uh, I, yeah, I, but I wouldn't say I wouldn't say it was all doom and gloom. I think there were a lot of optimistic notes that were hit about you know, the benefits of future cooperation and, and how things may change for the better, um, as painful as it may be to, to change our current paradigm. But um, I think the fact that there are so many people that are engaged and, and ready and willing to work on this topic in a serious fashion with, across scientific, academic, government, military, you know, all communities, mental health and, 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 um, and uh, medical field. It's, uh, it's encouraging to see that the energy level is high, and I, I hope that continues. I, I do, and, and I, I think that is a, absolutely a fair characterization. I, so when Chris was giving his speech throughout, I would say like the first three quarters of it, I was like, oh my God, he doesn't think that, that disclosing all of this is a good idea. And then I started having second thoughts going, you know, well, shit, am I doing the right thing? Um, messaging this and and then he then at the end he he said exactly what you just said that the 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 benefits outweigh the risk it has to happen there are good things that can come out of it but it has to ha it has to be handled correctly and um yeah indeed anything else I'm I'm good if you are. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think well we're at, we're out of time. So uh, so a it was it was great. Uh, let's see, I have a little. Uh, uh, let's see, did I put the photo in here? I did not. Um, actually, yeah, I'm gonna put it up here. Um, but uh, yeah, it's not coming up. Anyway, yeah, we we made, we had to, we had some, a really good time and and um, it was great meeting a lot of the people. That uh, such as yourself, uh, you're one of the moderators on our sh uh, chat moderators on our show, and I'm often uh, th uh, thoughtless and forget to thank uh, thank you guys. But uh, it was great making new friends and talking to people, uh, having private conversations with folks on the side about this and getting their their uh, uh, perspectives from uh, from officials. Uh, but Nick, man, we're definitely going to have you back. Thanks, Matt. It's been a pleasure. I really enjoyed talking to you. you. This is what you're doing here is a it's great work, and I'm a big fan. So I'll I'm gonna stay engaged. 
Thank you. Well, and and I and I think the thing too, it's it's like you know, I'm no one special. I'm some guy in his bedroom doing this shit. Uh, uh, everybody has an important part to play in this. You have a voice. Um, the the political activism. There's this guy Sawan who's who's on fire. That's always calling staffers and and um, you know there there are people that that are really. You can get involved and you can let your lawmakers know that this is important and to stop burying your head, their head in the sand and deal with this thing head on. Uh, Nick, I'm going to let you go. I know you got things to do with your family. Thanks for coming on. Thanks very much, Matt. Talk to you soon. Okay. All right. Thanks. All right. Uh, let's see here. Uh, well, we'll do that. Sorry about that. Okay. So uh, uh, we'll go. Uh, I'll do some listener questions here. Um, our moderators. Uh, try to um, kind of uh, call that in. Uh, all right. And again, some of this I, I can't answer because I wasn't there for day one. So scrolling back here, um, uh, Uplifting Tweet says, thanks uh, for the shout out in the chat. So uh, our, our friend Uplifting Tweets has made a lot of our show graphics. A guy's like crazy talented and we always appreciate him, uh, his, his time. Um, and, and really kind of everyone, this, this is a, a, literally a one-man show and, uh, in terms of here in, in, in my home where I do this from. But there are a lot of people that are not here that support us and uh, moderate our chat, uh, you know, uh, Mary Misanthrope and, and some others. I hate naming names because you always leave someone out. Uh, anyway, uh, let's see. Da, 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 da. Uh, let's see. Sorry. Uh, from uplifting, oh yeah, sorry. Uh, uh, so Scouse uh, Mastiffs, Matt, do you get the feeling Carl Nell will be the new um, the new director? Um, I do not. I I I don't think he will. Uh, a couple of people that I asked said that 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 would most likely not be the case. I've, you know, I've often said, like for me, if, if the government came to me and said, hey, Matt, we like what you're doing, uh, we're going to tell you everything that's going on, but we got to give you a clearance and you have to sign this National, Dis uh, National Security Non-Disclosure Act, I would turn them down. I would rather be able to have the freedom to talk about what I know and what people who do have security clearances share. They never share anything classified. But the minute you, you have to sign something like that, you, you, you know, you're muzzled. And I would venture to guess that uh, Colonel Nell probably feels the same way and his talents and his knowledge of, of crash retrieval programs and whatnot far outweighs being the head of a bureaucratic uh, agency uh, uh, currently run by... Um, Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick, who's a freaking clown. Uh, anyway, uh, so uh, sorry, going to uh, continue on here. Um, we threw this together very last minute. Everybody's doing stuff for the holidays, so um, why well, I'm a little bit uh, disorganized here. I apology. Uh, apologies. Too close. Thank you for the five dollar super chat. You you rock. Uh, Chill Farm Brisbane. A de oops, sorry. A date uh, of the October. Uh, 2034 for five eyes acceptance was shown at the Seoul event. Could you elaborate for the non USA community? Um, to be honest, I don't remember that. And um, yeah, so I, I wish I could add some context to that, but I don't remember. I, I, I one of the things that stuck out about what uh, Colonel Nell spoke about the uh, the debunkers on on planet P um, and particularly ones that sit in Rupert Murdoch's basement have have alluded to that uh, this is just like the JFK file legislation uh, it's not going to do anything we'll be 40 years out and and that's it uh, he he spent a considerable amount of time I don't remember the specifics where he pointed out how this was completely, completely different. And the, legis the legislation starts from a place of everything must be disclosed. And then the people that have, that have classified these things, DOE and elsewhere, they have to justify why it has to stay classified. Now, another point 
that he brought up is the the committee which which interestingly enough he pointed out cannot have any uh, legacy program members. So if you're a legacy gatekeeper or worked on uh, worked for a Pentagon contractor that was part of the uh, crash retrieval and back in engineering program, you could not serve on the committee, period, the end. Uh, another thing that I thought of note was uh, Colonel Nell spoke about that, um, that the president can decide on national security grounds, whether in the end something is is disclosed or not in terms of uh, classified information. So if he determines a particular piece of, cl of classified information that the, uh, I think it's nine person committee has deemed should be uh, re uh, revealed to the public, the president has the final say and he can veto that. Uh, anyway, uh, there's that. Uh, okay, so that was, uh, thank you for that question. Uh, Drew Cook, what was the most sobering comment expressed by the panelists at the conference? Um, it was the, the catastrophic uh, disclosure versus a controlled disclosure. Um, I mean, I've always kind of thought about what the consequences would be, and I've, uh, for like if how this NHI reacts to, let's just say Biden or whoever our future president is, gets up on the podium and says, this is what is here, it's always been here, these are the things we've recovered. And, and I've always wondered to myself how this thing, whatever it is, and from what I understand, it's many different things, how it will then decide to react. It's like, well, hey, the whole public knows. Let's show up above everybody's uh, house, and um, and you know we just don't know because we don't understand. We, we one thing that that and I think it was Nell or it could have been Mellon. I don't recall. Was the statement we don't know what their agenda is. We don't know what their agenda is. So when you keep that in mind, uh, you know it really makes you makes you stop and think. And the other element to that, I had never heard people in a very specific quantify, sit and quantify and enumerate how things could go off the rails. And um, I mean, it was, it was uh, you know, it was frightening. And, and I, you know, maybe my take on it was much more somber than, than Nick's, but, but um, Again, as Nick pointed out, all of these folks, you know, they stated that, um, that, you know, that this has to happen and good can come out of it if it's handled correctly. And the way it's been handled up until now has, uh, has uh, been a, a uh, really a, a dereliction in duty and not serving the American people's interests uh, at all. And, you know, one thing I would like to point out is when this kind of stuff is hidden from our elected individuals, our policymakers, how can they make correct policy decisions that affect all of us as Americans if they don't, if they are not being given all the information by um, a, a group of individuals? I'll just say that. Um, it's un-American. It endangers our national security, uh, and it's a slap in the face to uh, to democracy. And so, when you have somebody like Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick that has to do the bidding of Ron Moultrie or whoever else is telling him what to do, I mean that it's. I'm sorry, it's un-American. Uh, uh, full stop. Uh, okay, so let's see here. Uh, so that was uh, what I thought, uh, or my thoughts on that. Um, Pat Grant was valet a sweet man. So I, he spoke on the first day, so I missed that. Um, I would say that he, he got up, he, he, he got up to respond to Nell's, uh, part of the presentation where he spoke about the eminent domain, uh, issue. So, you know, so if you think about it, there are private contractors that have spent their own money, um, 
on this topic. There are scientists that have spent their own uh, time, which is, of course, the most valuable commodity all of us uh, as humans have, on materials and whatnot. So uh, Jacques Vallée was a little bit agitated about that. And frankly, I don't, I don't blame the guy. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a liberal, but I'm a liberal capitalist. I believe in making money and, um, you know, ethically. And it, I think it, it can be a slippery slope if that, is, if that sort of um, precedent is set that the, the, the United States government can come in to a, uh, a private business and decide, oops, you know, this is ours. It's, I, I, I do think it's a bad idea. Uh, there needs to be uh, some kind of compromise on that. So, uh, you know, let's say that, that the vehicles that, that these guys have um, and have been in their possession um, are returned back to the government, you know, perhaps a compromise, and I do think I remember somebody saying this, although I don't recall who, perhaps a compromise is that the, um, the, the contractor is allowed to uh, profit off of the technology that they learned from. I mean, who knows? I'm, that's, that's way above, above my pay grade. Uh, okay, uh, uh, gloaming. Was there anything at the symposium that gave the impression that the NHI is forcing government's hand and speeding up disclosure. I know it was mentioned chaotic disclosure is a worry. Is uh, any smoking gun? Um, I wouldn't say that there was a smoking gun. I would say probably, um, for me anyway, uh, Tim, Tim's detail, detailing of of the Tic Tac event and how the, vid the, the videos, both classified and what ended up being unclassified, were, were shared on the Cipranet with, with the naval chain of command and how it was promptly the following day uh, erased. The entire email chain was removed from Cipranet, which he said just kind of never happens. And the message was it was the unsaid message was this is not something any of us in the in the uh, in the uh, admirals uh, I don't know military stuff very well but uh, in that leadership it was just not to be uh, uh, discussed so um, other you know th and again none of this was like smoking gun hey this is what's buried here or whatnot really in in my experience. The whole point of this conference was really talking about public policy and the consequences of how this needs to be handled in a very thoughtful, methodical, careful way. Uh, okay, Bill Lacey, thank you very much for the super chat. Uh, you are the man. I appreciate that. Um, and also, again, folks, please tell your friends about us. Hit that like, subscribe, leave a comment. Uh, and all of that stuff, what happens is the social media algorithms, they see that. And, and when they see a lot of people clicking the button, all that you know, stuff that you're always being bugged about, that's what tells the algorithm to start organically suggesting our shows and others uh, that are doing really great work as well. It's what, it's what brings our content to people that are not tracking this topic. And at the end of the day, I think one of the message, messages from the comment I'm sorry, from the conference was go and talk to this, uh, to people that don't track this, talk to them about this and let them know what's going on. Tell them where the data is, where they can look. Um, it's certainly not Metabunk, Metabunk. Um, uh, and you know, tell people where they can find the data and uh, in particular the Schumer Amendment and let them decide for themselves. Okay, uh, Keith Taylor, how many are experiencing it now but are afraid uh, to talk about it? Millions. Uh, can we talk about the humanities presenters? I'm sorry, CJ, I don't understand that uh, question. Maybe one of our mods can uh, talk about that. Um, any mention of the evidence NASA has but denies through its director? I, um, no, I don't recall anything about that uh, at all. Uh, Bill Lacey, thank you, sir, for the super chat. Uh, Anonymous Rex, question, why all the media lockdown during the conference? I would say, um, 
I think it's probably for two reasons. Um, one, it wanted to be a, uh, a safe space where people, particularly people that are former government or worked in intelligence and held TSSEI clearances could, <clears throat> excuse me, A, talk freely without having to worry about something being misconstrued. And then I would also imagine too, um, if any of them slipped up and did say something that, that they would be able to uh, make sure it didn't get disseminated. That's my own personal opinion. I could be wrong, but that, that was my, my uh, take on it. I know when I, when I was initially uh, invited by Gary and was trying to understand the ground rules, it, what he said was, you can talk about it, but don't talk about what occurred at the conference until after the fact. Um, and I didn't ask any questions. I figured he knew, uh, he had uh, understood the reasons better than myself. Um, and uh, let's see, uh, DIY uh, Craft Q, thank you so much for the super chat. Um, and uh, Rikin Sunbro, uh, thank you uh, for, your, uh, for your contributions as well. I'm going to give you a follow. Uh, okay, let's see here. Uh, la, la, sorry, uh, scrolling through here. Um, Oliver Jenkin, question. What, if anything, do you think would finally pivot the U.S. government to, to disclose to the public? Um, I don't know. Uh, I mean, you know, what I do know and I speak to a lot of people uh, behind the scenes in Congress, you know, they're aware of, of the reality of this and they understand that it's serious stuff and they understand that it's, it's been mishandled and, uh, and stuff's been kept from them, uh, probably illegally. I mean, maybe these, these uh, folks uh, found a way to get around things legally. Um, but, I, you know, I'm not really sure. Again, one of my big takeaways from the conference was uh, a better understanding of how complex an issue this is for our government uh, to not really mess up and mishandle this and the downstream consequences of this being not correctly handled. I mean, it's, it's, it's significant and it, it um, I mean, it, I mean, in many ways it really shook me and, uh, and at times it you know, really made me self-reflect about what I'm doing and how I talk about this and, and how um, I have to be careful about what I say um, just, to be res just to treat this in a responsible manner. Um, again, I never under when Lou Elizondo made that somber comment, I never kind of really understood what he meant, but it after this, it really, now I get it. Uh, okay, uh, figu7716, thank you for the donation. Uh, thank you. Uh, let's see here. Um, figu, uh, Rick and Sunbros, uh, yeah, I'm going to give you a follow. I uh, understand you uh, know uh, friends of ours. Uh, and th again, thank you for the super chat. Uh, was Danny Sheehan in attendance? Yes, Danny Sheehan was in attendance and he did not speak, but I met with him after and he wants to come on the show. So we're very excited about that. Um, there were some other people that I won't reveal their names, but people you would definitely know that were uh, that want to come on the show. And I have to say one of the coolest things about being at this conference, I had so many people come up to me and express their gratitude and, and um, their appreciation for this show and what we are trying to do here and that we treat this in a non-sensationalized uh, way and we try to approach what we do here from the lens of national security. I, I can't even tell you how many people uh, came up to me. I was frankly uh, kind of embarrassed and surprised by the amount of folks. and. Um, I'm just, I'm very, 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 very grateful and uh, thank you uh, for that. Uh, okay, uh, Jeremy F., you mentioned extensively talking to one of the whistleblowers. 
can you uh, disclose any details about that? I cannot, um, and I'm sure you understand why. Uh, I did have, and I don't have permission to talk about it, I did have uh, some very extensive conversations with someone that is not publicly, kno publicly known that was in the UAP task force. And um, uh, we'll just say some of the comments about Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick and uh, his propensity for not following up is um, not a good look. Uh, and just some of the other things that were shared by this individual, um, some of it was pretty rattling, to be, uh, to be frank. Uh, okay, so as Jeremy F., um, uh, Al B Basterwool, humanities presenters, the religious commentators at the end of the event. Um, yes, okay, now I understand. Yeah, so uh, at the end of this, uh, you had um, uh, you had a couple of humanity. Uh, so you had a, a Paul Thigpen, a PhD, who discussed uh, they are all God's children's insight, insights from the Catholic theology on UAP and non-human intelligence, and essentially, kind of what he was saying is that the Catholic Church has been aware of this. Uh, it fits in the framework of Christianity, uh, or at least uh, with, uh, with their view of, of, of Catholicism, and that um, and whatever the, our, higher, uh, our higher power is, that, that we're not the only ones they made. Um, so it was a lot of discussions on that. Uh, I, like I said, I was operating on like no sleep, so towards the end of the day, man, I was just fried. It was... There was so much stuff going through my head, just trying to digest uh, what was put out there and the seriousness of it. Um, yeah, uh, I, I wish we had been able at least to have uh, re recorded, uh, made a recording just for our personal note taking, because it was just so much stuff. Um, yeah, it was, it was some shit. Uh, Bill. Where are the 40 plus firsthand whistleblowers? So what I can tell you about that, and I brought this up um, to, um, I brought this up on one of our shows and I had actually alerted some folks in Congress uh, back in the spring that this was gonna happen. But uh, uh, these whistleblowers bypassed Arrow uh, on the advice of many of us to not go to Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick and they went directly to the IG and they filed PPD-19s, uh, which is a presidential, uh, uh, presidential uh, directive 19, which is a whistleblower statue, statute. And because of that, and because these are all people with, that have signed national security non-disclosure agreements, and if they go public and start talking, they could end up in jail and nobody wants that. Uh, so that is what's happening. Uh, that is what has happened. Um, I don't know if it's currently still, I don't know if people are still going in and uh, filing the PPD-19s or if that's tapered off. I don't have any information on that. Uh, but that's, that's uh, where that's at. Uh, someone had asked me if I felt that they are going to go public. I would be wildly surprised uh, if, if they did. I mean, if you sit and you look at um, what Stephen Greenstreet and, and some of these other um, uh, folks that I would say uh, have a screw loose, uh, to put it mildly, what they, the insinuation and the uh, disparagement and the um, pond scum behavior, as my friend Ross Coltart uh, pointed out, you look at what was directed at Dave Grush and these folks, uh, the debunkers trying to make an example out of him, and again, I'm quite convinced a lot of these debunkers um, are not doing this for free. Uh, if you're a whistleblower, you have to ask yourself, what is the benefit in talking publicly about this, especially uh, with the, the legal consequences and the legal exposure that you would put yourself under, and also as well the um, the abuse, and we've seen what, what um, you know, when, you, when you've got somebody working for the New York Post that is basically saying because this guy's autistic, he doesn't know what the fuck he's talking about, um, 
yeah, it makes my blood boil. Um, what a just disgusting human being. And anybody that piled onto that, uh, I think, is uh, disgusting and needs to take a hard look, um, hard look at the mirror at what kind of human they've turned out to be. Obviously, I'm very opinionated, opinionated about that. Um, let's see. Uh, Kurt, Matt, you might be doing this show out of your bedroom, but you're very professional and very well informed, and we all appreciate you. Thank you very, very much. Uh, that means a lot, uh, these, these comments. Uh, doing this show, it takes money, it takes time, uh, it takes a lot of understanding from the wife, and um, it's comments like that that let me know that, that, that I'm doing, doing the right thing. Uh, Jonathan Mingle, what does this mean, RA Senator Gillibrand, especially related to her recent comments? Uh, I, frankly, I don't know. Um, I, I'm not real sure. Uh, I can say with 100% confidence that, that she believes all of this is real and has had many people speak to her in private uh, that hold security clearances. Uh, her staff is very well informed. Her staff is very, very qualified uh, in terms of national security and intelligence issues. Uh, these are not people fresh out of college, as uh, Mick West would uh, like you to believe. Uh, these, are, uh, these are intelligence and defense professionals that advise people like Senator Gillibrand on national security matters. And they talk to a lot of people and they spend a lot of time in skiffs talking to people about classified uh, things regarding the UAP topic. So, uh, so uh, regarding her, her, her comment, I, I know what you're talking about was with, I think she had expressed disappointment, disappointment in Sean Kirkpatrick's um, departure of this. You know, I, I had a long conversation when she, when Senator Gillibrand came on our show and, and we had an interview with her, uh, you know, I also had a, a very private conversation with her that was not for air. And I know that she has a lot of respect for Dr. Kirkpatrick. Um, I, I personally think he's been the wrong person for the job, but I think uh, perhaps she has felt differently and everybody is going to have their own personal opinion about someone. And all I can say is that we would not be here where we are right now if it had not been for Senator Gillibrand, uh, Marco Rubio, um, and uh, of course, Senator uh, Harry Reid. We would not be here if it weren't for the work that they have done on this topic and would not be here if, if certain people had not spoken to them in a classified setting about all of this stuff. Uh, it just, we wouldn't be in, in this, uh, we wouldn't be here right now. Uh, okay, and I'm gonna have to wrap it up quick because I got a flight to catch. Uh, did any individual speak about perception management referring to, when referring to UAPs? Uh, you're talking about information and perception man management organizations. Uh, no, uh, actually, that would have been a great question to ask. It never it never crossed uh, my mind. So an IPMO contractor can let's say go and um, uh, and IPMO is run out of OUSDINS, Office of Undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence and Security by Ronald Moultrie. So let's say you need to um, be a squeaky wheel on Twitter. You want to be, a, you need somebody to be a debunker on Twitter uh, and uh, uh, spread disinformation and really kind of chaos and try to sow conflict on social media platforms. Um, one way of doing that is a, you, the IPMO contractor that you might uh, have uh, under, your, uh, under your watch at uh, uh, OUSDINS, their whole mission is to go and and manipulate a, a public perception of things. The idea is that that's done uh, to our foreign adversaries. However, there is, so you, uh, let's say you pay a journalist under the table uh, that might work at the New York Times and, uh, or somewhere else or, or uh, at uh, the New York Post. 
and uh, you you can that contractor can employ that individual to push a narrative uh, at the bidding of of what the the Pentagon or the intelligence community would like, and it's a way of them to do that and uh, and and not. It's sort of like running like a shell corporation to, to, to hide an affiliation. I have no knowledge that any of these debunkers are doing that. Um, it's my personal punch. Um, again, you have to sit and ask yourself. It's like if I had a friend of mine that believed in the Loch Ness Monster and was tweeting about it on Twitter, I'd be like, hey, man, you know, I think it's a bunch of bullshit, but knock yourself out if you want to spend all day tweeting about it or whatever. I'm going to go... I'm just going to go play with my kids or go to my soccer matches. When you sit and you think about the amount of time these debunkers spend on this, on something they don't believe in, you, you, you know, it's, uh, you know, you just have to, you just have to wonder about it. Um, anyway, uh, I got to wrap it up here. Um, uh, what is your hope, uh, New Arrow D Director not being beholden to DODIC community? Yeah, I don't, it's just part of the game, though has to happen. Anyway, folks, uh, thanks for joining us and um, appreciate your support. Please tell your friends about our show. That's how our channel grows. That's how we're able to bring on better and better guests. Guests, uh, when you're trying to book them, they look at how big your show is, what your following's like, and uh, the better our following is in terms of numbers, it, it makes us more appealing for, for folks uh, to come on and be a part of our show. Anyway, I uh, hope uh, everyone has a wonderful Thanksgiving and uh, happy holidays, all that good stuff. And more coming soon from The Good Trouble Show, including something extremely big um, that uh, I'm working on uh, with some other folks uh, that will uh, knock the Pentagon on its knees.